Morning, everybody. This is Jim Hodson and Kevin Renshaw here at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home of the most touchable warbirds in Texas. And uh, we're proud to say that the restoration is complete and Kevin's going to walk us around the airplane now that it's done. So, Kevin, it's all yours. Okay. Well, what we're looking at here is YF-16 number two, the second of the, the long line of F-16s to be built and flown. This one first flew in on May 9th of 1974, and we got it restored to this level by its 50th birthday. Yes. We had a big rollout on May 30th of this year, so that, that, that's a 50 year point. Uh, a lot of work went into this. We've been at this for the last four years. Uh, the aircraft, as it flew from 74 to 79, in 1979 it suffered a nose gear failure, and the Air Force labs at Rome, New York took on the airframe as a test body for the production program to test all the inlets, all the, me, all the antennas and electronics for the production airplane. Uh, when we got it, it didn't have a nose on it. The, the uh, original nose had been busted. Uh, it had a uh, production nose sort of scabbed on so they could get that part of the shape right. They had stretched the airplane 10 inches. Let's show them where that took place, yeah. Kevin. Um, right here at this joint, they had taken the airplane apart. That's a normal manufacturing joint. It's meant to, you know, it was built there originally. They, they put 10 inches of, of homemade sheet metal work into it. They put a, a big structure in the ammo drum bay to uh, keep it together. Uh, they'd also stretch the wing tips because the production airplane is six inches more on each tip. And they added additional hard points. There was a difference in where the, the uh, store's hard points were, <coughs> excuse me, between the YF and the production airplane. Uh, some other differences on the jet. Uh, the YF had a two-piece nose landing gear door. I get little notes every now and then from pictures we've posted on Facebook from F-16 maintainers going, what's up with that? <laughs> well, there were only two airplanes that had that, number one and number two. Uh, airplane number one is in the Virginia Air and Space Museum, and it's hanging from the ceiling because it doesn't have any landing gear. Right. So they just screwed all their doors shut. Uh, when we got this one, it didn't have landing gear either because they'd had it on a pole as a test subject all that time. Uh, we were lucky to find an uh, early model F-16 landing gear that had come off a wrecked F-16. And it fit right in. It fit right in. I, I know the engineer that designed the landing gear, Travis Putman, and he said the, the YF gear worked so well, he didn't feel the need to change anything on the production. So all the bolts and everything, it just slipped right in. The tire sizes are a little different, but we're never going to retract the gear here. Well, that was one of the myths. You know, we'd heard it had A7 landing gear and B-58 nose wheels and things like that. It actually, the, the YF did have it had this landing gear geometry, but the tires and brakes were B-58. Were they? Okay. Yes. Okay, so that part was true. Yeah, that, that they were very small tires. They were just some that were laying around in stock over at uh, Aerodynamics at that point. I mentioned that we had to rebuild the front end of the airplane. As we go by here, one other point. You see Kay Granger, our congresswoman's name on the aircraft. She was instrumental in getting the airplane for us. Boy, she sure was. When the lab finished all their testing in, in 2018, uh, the GAO wrote it off as surplus, and they were going to send the airplane down to Eglin Air Force Base as a ground target. Yep. It could have been blown up. Yep. But no, nope, if, it, if it wasn't for uh, for Congresswoman Granger, this airplane wouldn't be here and probably right. wouldn't exist. So. so she argued the Air Force, the Secretary of the Air Force into shipping it to us instead of Eglin. So we're very happy about that. And then we've had the last four years to work on it. The front end of the airplane, we had to completely rebuild. From here forward is new construction fiberglass. Um, production radome on it, a production radar bulkhead. So we took everything off from the cockpit forward. We found the original layout drawings. We had a mold made off the layout drawings, off an NC mold by a company called DCU Models over in Wiley, Texas. And they did that for us for free, so I, I need to give them some props here. They, they helped us a lot. Uh, one of the guys here in the museum, Butch Sickles, is a, a master fiberglass fabricator. So he produced this whole nose. It was actually done in two pieces, top and bottom, but you can't find the seam on this. Not anymore. It is, it is so smooth and, and well put together. We've got the angle of attack probes mounted on it. We've got the uh, uh, pitot static probe on the nose. 
So it's back to kind of how it looked. We're not going to put the flight test probe on it because that will poke somebody in yeah, the arm. Right. We don't need an eight foot probe out the front of no. the plane. Um, the paintwork is credit goes to uh, Lanny Parcell and his crew at Cowtown Aerocrafters up in Justin, Texas. They, they've done all the, the hand sanding and, and shooting the paint for us. Just an amazing job. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Got the airplane back to the paint job it wore in. Uh, Actually, it would have been this May of 1975. Right. This airplane originally came out in a, a blue and white camouflage air-to-air -air paint job that only lasted about a month because it turned out not to be a very <laughs> good camouflage. Um, it was painted flat gray after that and then got the, the red, white, and blue paint job when it went on the international air show circuit. Right. Went to the Paris air show, went to the Farnborough air show. Uh, this is also the airplane. If you've ever seen videos of an F-16 landing gear up, Neil Anderson uh, did not respect a request from engineering not to roll the airplane while the gear is cycling and he jammed the right gear up in the well. Ended up putting it on its belly in the grass alongside the runway at Carswell Air Force Base. Um, kind of embarrassing. <laughs> the aircraft was put back together in four weeks and it was flying again later that year. But it's one of those learned about flying from right. that moments. Well, and we gave, we gave it a chin job when we got it. Yeah. <laughs> it still had that damage on it. Yep. We could find all the different places where it had uh, internal damage and things that had been repaired or replaced. So we've got it back put together as much as we can. Uh, looking up the inlet, Jerry Asher, one of the guys, that, one of the main workers up there at Cowtown Aircrafters, <laughs> built us a an engine face to put in the, at the end of the inlet duct. Um, also, I get people online asking me, hang on. Well, to give Jerry credit, he is an aviation artist. He is. And that is really Jerry artwork. Jerry is a serious restorer of airplanes. Um, I get people asking about the strut in here and why we painted it. Well, the YF was painted. Production airplane, that strut is heated. Right. So it, it's always silver, but on the prototype, it was not heated. That's an anti-icing feature that the prototype, they, okay. only, they did not fly in icing conditions. So that's why the production ones, it says hot on the intake. It says hot. Okay. Don't touch that. Okay. It's an anti-ice uh, thing to keep ice from forming on that strut and going downstream. That strut keeps the, the smiley face from turning into a circle. Okay. It's a tension strut to keep the, with the high pressure air inside the inlet. Okay. Otherwise, the shape would try and change. So All right. So it would flex. Out. Yeah. And well, it, it doesn't ever collapse. No. It's always under tension. But if that wasn't there, it that would there, it would flex. Under, yes. And that would flex. that would change the shock wave at, at Mach. Now, among other things. Yeah. Yes, it would change yeah. the, the whole shape of the inlet and the performance of the inlet. Well, you've got some toys here too. Do you want to show some, some folks toys some toys? Over here. Uh, the canopy is off right now because we're getting ready to do some work in the cockpit. Once again, some people that helped us out enormously. Uh, PPG Plastics in Grand Prairie, Texas, used to be Techstar Plastics, offered to make us a brand new canopy. And I'm going to grab the other piece. Okay. I'm going to just walk around this so people can see it. This is probably the prettiest canopy I've ever seen anywhere. It is just crystal clear. And Kevin's going to show you what the uh, original looked like when we first picked it up. This Got the is airplane. The rear part of the transparency that goes behind this goes back here. You see up on the frame. The whole this bubble, the, the one that was on there, looked like this. Thirty-year-old poly or fifty-year-old polycarbonate turns yellow, and then the lab had sprayed it with a conductive paint. So it was going to be kind of nasty looking. Well, and we tried to clean the original. It just started cracking, and yeah, uh, it just didn't want to. Didn't want to hold. But this so is just amazing. PPG fabricated this from scratch. Now, it's a little different than the production one. It's the same shape as a production canopy, but this one is thinner. This is 3 eighths of an inch thick. Okay, because it's not going to fly. No, but this is the, the thickness the prototype was. Oh, it was. Okay, that part I didn't realize. This was before they got into the thing about bird strike testing. Oh, okay. This is strong enough for all the air loads. Okay. And actually was strong enough for the bird to not go through the glass. But it flexed too much, and it actually was hitting things. Well, wasn't this one of the first clear canopies like this without this any canopy the first reels? Time somebody had a no bow frame canopy on a fighter aircraft. Yeah, I remember people talking about it. That it's like you're sitting on top of a ball and you could see oh, yeah. the whole world. One of the test, one of the early test pilots said, on his first takeoff, he felt like he'd forgotten to close the canopy. 
because he was sitting up so high and he could see everywhere. There's I get that. I get that. Sure. Absolutely. Again, and this is another one of these instances where people helped us as partners in this deal. PPG and the uh, model company you mentioned in, uh, in Pronto uh, delivering the airplane over yep. to Prop Wash and bringing it back. We just could not have done this without the yep. uh, generous support. Local companies recognize how important this airplane was to the history of, of the DFW area. We have an ejection seat here that's gonna go into the aircraft. We've got it out right now because we're going to do work on the on the instrument panels, and this is kind of makes it hard to get in there and work on things. Now, this is an actual ejection seat, correct? This is. This is an Escapac. This particular version here is called a 1C. This came out of an A7. Now, that's the same seat they used in the YF-16, but they modified it. When it was in the A7, it has two metal horns up here right. that are called canopy breakers. And since the YF-16, you're never going to go through that polycarbonate, they took those off to improve the clearance, but a 1C2, 1C-2 seat goes in an A7. Take these off, it becomes a H8. And there are only two H8 seats ever made, and they were the ones for the two YF-16s. Maybe that's where the A7 myth came from. Could be. There, there were some other pieces and things. The nose gear steering motor was an A7. Okay, okay. And there's lots of little bits. You know, they, they used a lot of off-the-shelf hardware. Most of the instruments in the cockpit came out of F-111 stock as General Dynamics. Okay. Yeah, you know, there's... If you don't have to reinvent something, you don't. Well, and they kind of had to do this one on the cheap, too, didn't they? Yes. That's the amazing part. So the contract was let in 1972 to build two prototypes. That's basically all the contract said was build and deliver two prototypes and teach our test pilots to fly them. Um, they built two airplanes, the first airplane in 21 months. Wow. And they did the whole contract for $37 million, which is about $250 million in today's dollars. It's just crazy. I mean, it's just crazy that they did that. Yeah. And this airplane was originally designed to only fly about 300 hours, correct? Yes. Um, that's why the nose gear problem came up later. Okay. It was designed to be a prototype uh, or a demonstrator and just fly about 300 hours. They kept flying it after that. They were doing 100-hour condition inspections. Uh, at 900 hours is when a bracket on the nose gear broke and the nose gear wouldn't extend all the way. Okay. Phil Ostriker landed it on the two mains and then the nose came down and it skinned up the, the bottom of the nose and blew the radome off. Okay, so that wasn't Neil. That was, that was, well, that Phil. was Phil. Okay. Neil, well, Neil didn't get the belly landed. We got this other little drum here and I know there's an interesting ah, story that goes with that. That is the ammunition drum. Aircraft number one did not have a gun and did not have weapons capability. Number two did all the gun firing and weapons. This is the original serial number drum. Interesting point, it says YF-16 Proto right there on the thing. General Electric custom made that to fit this airplane. Um, when we started the YF-16 program, there was not a 500 round ammo drum. Basically, they gave General Electric, here's the dimensions you've got to fit in. It goes between these two bulkheads in the aircraft. It would actually be on its side. Uh, it's a spiral feed, 20 millimeter, and the empties come back from the gun and go back in the can. Well, interesting too, it looks like a miniature uh, can from the F-111. Oh yeah, they're all related. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The basic design, General Electric would just determine how many rounds you needed by adjusting the length of the can. So, tell them how we found this. So, there was an aircraft salvage yard in Wichita Falls where we used to go shop for bags of nuts and bolts and other things we need for all the airplanes. Uh, Bill Morris, who started this project, was looking around and he, he knew what this was. He recognized it as an F-16 ammo drum, but when he got to the data plate and saw that it says YF-16 Proto, he knew it was the correct serial number that goes with this airplane. We had this airplane here. Uh, you know, he was just so happy to get that whole thing back here. Now, someday we'll find a demilitarized uh, gun and, and feed belt system. We'll put that on display. We did not put that back in the airplane where no one will ever see it. Either. Right. No, this is fine. And uh, I know I've had people say, is that the proper placement for the gun today? No, it's not. Okay. Um, when they rearranged the aircraft going to production, they actually moved the gun one bay back. So about 24 inches farther aft. Why did they do that? Well, a couple things. Gun muzzle right here was about lined up with the pilot's head. Okay. So it was very noisy. Um, 
Also, there was some aerodynamics of when you're firing the gun, it gets into the, the flow coming off the straight. So this actually moved back to here. Okay. And the whole gun assembly, they swapped part of a fuel tank and the ammo drum bay. Okay. What we know today on a production F-16 is the F-1 fuel tank, the forward number one fuel tank, was on this aircraft was very small. You know, they made it much larger on the production airplane by swapping it and combining the, uh, the, the tanks there and moving the gun ammo drum farther back. Uh, one of the other neat tricks Jerry uh, Asher did when we restored this, this little scoop, this exit here and these cooling scoops, there's an emergency power unit uh, called a hydrazine uh, auxiliary power unit or, or EPU emergency power unit uh, that was in that area behind the seat. That was the exhaust. It had been fared over. The lab had just put a, a metal plate over it. Jerry actually fabricated a fake in, uh, scoop in there. Nice. You know, painted it up so it looks nice. Hey, everybody who worked on this wanted to make this just the absolute oh, yeah. best restoration they could. Yeah, everybody jumped into this and you know, we had guys on the thing that had worked on the F-16 production line, worked on the flight line. Right. Uh, we had one guy, Dave Anderson, whose dad was the flight test engineer on this airplane. His dad was in charge of plotting the missions and getting the air aircraft ready to go every day. So he was doing it kind of for his dad. And that, that's about as cool as you get. Is... It really is. And, I, and I, I mentioned this to everybody at the unveiling, but I will put this airplane up against any restoration anywhere in the world as being one of the best restorations I've ever seen. This is just amazing work that you guys all did. And it's a real tribute to yourselves and to the museum and to the community. Because what is it? It's about 4,600 of these have been built. Yes. Serving, in, serving in, I believe, 26, 26 different countries. countries. So it's, it's probably, and I, we've seen articles recently, of people saying that it could serve for another 50 years. Yeah. And who's ever heard of a 100-year-old fighter that was still effective? That would be like that would be like this flying against a uh, uh, a biplane yeah. or a Jenny. So, well, Kevin, I think we're just about out of our time here today. Is there anything else you'd like to tell everybody? No, I just want to thank everybody that worked on it, and everybody that supplied parts and you know all, everything that went into this. This has been four years of a lot of work. A lot of people put their heart and soul into this, and it shows. It absolutely does, and uh, like you said, we've still got a little bit to go. Uh, our challenge now is to raise funds to be able to put this into a real building. Yes. Uh, it's here in the glowworm. It will live here until we can put up a structure. Uh, we have the ground here to put it up on, yes. uh, but we're going to get ready for a capital campaign later, uh, later in, the, in the summer or the fall. So for now, from uh, Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home to the most touchable warbirds in Texas, Kevin, thank you oh, for you and the, the crew and the hat. Yeah, absolutely. We've got all kinds of... Uh, new F YF-16 material in the, in the museum store now. So uh, once again, thank you. Have a good uh, 4th of July and uh, come out and see this beauty. Thank you.